Welcome back to our series on Introduction to Object-Oriented Programming. So far, we've covered three of the four main principles, so be sure to check out the link in the description for the rest of the series if you need to catch up. This episode, we will be covering the final of the four main principles, polymorphism. So without further ado, let's get into it. Polymorphism describes methods that are able to take on many forms. There are two types of polymorphism. The first one is what is called dynamic polymorphism. Dynamic polymorphism occurs during the runtime, or when the program is being executed. This describes when a method signature is in both a subclass and a superclass. The methods share the same name and parameters, but have separate implementations. In this case, the subclass's implementation of the method overrides the superclasses. Let's go over an example. Let's say you are writing a program to represent many different types of cars in a class hierarchy. At the top of the hierarchy, you may have the generic car class. You then may create a sports car class as a subclass of the car class. You then may create a dot drive method in both of the classes. In each of the classes, the dot drive function will take a double representing the number of miles you would like the car to drive, and the car's gas attribute will be decreased by the pertinent amount. In the car class, the dot drive function may cause the car's gas to decrease by 0.04 gallons per mile, whereas the sports car class may instead have its gas decreased by 0.02 gallons per mile. If you create an instance of a sports car called my sports car, the sports car implementation of the dot drive method will override the generic car version of the dot drive method. Therefore, my sports car dot drive will decrease my sports car's gas attribute by 0.02 gallons per mile. However, were you to create an instance of the car class called my car, my car dot drive would instead decrease my car's gas by 0.04 gallons per mile. This is an example of dynamic polymorphism, as the implementation of a method signature can change depending on which level in the class hierarchy that it is called. This works this way because the form of the method that is called is decided dynamically as the program is run. This idea can be extended across a class hierarchy, in more layers than just two. You could add more subclasses representing different types of sports cars with their own dot drive methods with different implementations, and creating an instance of each of these subclasses would use their own implementation of the dot drive method when called. The main benefit of dynamic polymorphism is that it allows you to write methods in the superclass without having to include ifs and else ifs to account for exactly which subclass is being used. The second type of polymorphism is static polymorphism. Static polymorphism occurs during compile time rather than runtime. This refers to when multiple methods with the same name are defined in the same class. In this case, the methods are differentiated by their arguments. Either they take a different number of parameters, they take parameters of different types, or they take parameters in a different order than one another. This is known as method overloading. Despite the names of the methods being the same, they have different method signatures due to their differences in the parameters that they accept. To better understand this, let's go back to the car example. Let's say that you are working in the car class in this class, you are looking to create three different drive methods. The first drive methods argument accepts one integer and one string as parameters, say speed and destination. For clarity, we will refer to this one as drive method one. However, keep in mind that its method name is just drive. For drive method two, we will set its argument to accept two integers, for instance, distance and speed. Finally, in drive method 3, we will have it accept a string first for its destination, and then an integer for speed. This differs from drive method 1, in that drive method 1's parameters are in reverse order compared to drive method 3. In each of these three example methods, the method signature is different despite the methods having the same name. Therefore, the computer is able to tell the methods apart when the program is being compiled. For example, were I to call mycar.drive 
45 work? Drive method 1 would be called, as the argument given indicates that this is the method I would like to call. Furthermore, mycar.drive1560 would call drive method 2, and mycar.drive school30 would call drive method 3. When implementing method overloading, the different methods tend to have separate but similar effects. Despite drive method 1 and drive method 3 taking the same parameters, it is likely that their implementation would be different and thus would achieve separate effects. Otherwise, there would be no reason to have both methods. Keep in mind that method overloading can cause trouble if you do not keep straight which of the methods implementations you would like to execute and what form of argument is required to do so. Normally, if you call a method with too many parameters, or parameters of the incorrect type, then the program will throw an error, and you will be able to fix the issue. However, if you mistake the method's argument in such a way that one of the other methods with the same name is called instead, then you may not even be aware that you made a mistake. Overall, polymorphism simply allows methods to take on many different forms. It can be very useful in that it allows methods of the same name to exist both in the same class and in different classes. However, you must be careful to ensure that you are calling the correct form of the method that you want so that your program can function as intended. That does it for polymorphism. And with the end of polymorphism, the final of the four main principles, comes the end of this mini-series on an introduction to object-oriented programming. Hopefully you have gained enough of an understanding of object-oriented programming as a concept that you are able to get started implementing it in your own programs. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like and check out the many more we have like it on our channel. We have many more series and videos planned in the future, which we will be discussing in an update video coming out next week. So be sure to subscribe to be ready for that when it comes out. With all that said, thanks for watching.